Um, <clears throat> if you would turn in your Bible, not to the book of Exodus, but to the book of Philemon in the New Testament. If you're not sure where Philemon is, there's no shame in using the table of contents. Um, <clears throat> it is a very small book tucked away <clears throat> in the New Testament. Um, Uh, and this morning, uh, I'm going to be reading uh, verse 4 to 20. Uh, last week, we uh, <clears throat> did a series on understanding slavery in the Old Testament. Uh, we were talking about the slave laws in Exodus 21, and I told you that I would purposely leave out all discussion from the New Testament so that we could discuss it just today. So that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be talking about understanding slavery in the New Testament. Um, now, you all got an extra hour of sleep. So there is no excuse this morning. Um, so Philemon, uh, verse 4 to 20. If you will, read along in the text with me and we'll pray and then jump into the sermon this morning. <clears throat> Philemon, beginning in uh, verse 4. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this is perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of you owing me your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Uh, now, before we pray, I meant to give the context before we read this. So let me give that real quick and then we'll pray. Uh, basically, what is going on here is that Philemon is an, an owner, if you will, and he has a servant named Onesimus. Onesimus and Philemon get separated for one reason or another. Onesimus meets Paul down the road, and he begins serving with Paul. And Paul begins to discover that he belongs to Philemon. And so he's going to send Onesimus back to Philemon, but he is pleading with Philemon to basically let Onesimus go, to no longer serve as a servant. All right? And that's basically the context of what's going on here. All right, and I'll discuss more as we get into the sermon. So if you will, please pray with me for God's blessing upon this time now. <clears throat> Father, um, <clears throat> Lord, as we continue in our study of slavery uh, in the Bible, Lord, I pray that you would help um, me to, to, to make things very clear so that we would have a, a, just a good grasp or a understanding of this topic, Lord. Um, God, please open our minds. Please give us sharp minds right now, I pray, uh, to really wrestle with this topic, to really uh, engage it, and um, Lord, to, uh, to be able to, to walk out of here with knowledge that would not just be knowledge, but would actually be truth that we can share with the lost world. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that I will have fewer points in the sermon this morning than last week. The bad news is that it's only one fewer point. Last week I gave you 16 points regarding slavery in the Old Testament. 
And as I said, this is a complex topic, one that does not have a simple yes or no answer. Uh, and the complexity does not get any easier with the New Testament. Uh, so this morning, I'm going to give you 15 points regarding slavery in the New Testament. Now, if you missed last week, probably a lot of what we talk about this morning will be confusing to you. All right, so I want to encourage you, if you leave here confused, even if you made last week and you leave confused, I want to encourage you to go back and watch online the sermon from last week uh, because the two really go hand in hand. And I think if you watched last week, it'll help you understand this week. All right. Uh, Again, with this sermon, like last week, there's going to be very little application. All right. Very little application. Rather, my focus is to give us a paradigm for engaging the lost world on how do we talk about slavery in the Bible so that, as Paul says, we may know how we ought to answer each person, okay? So my hope is that when you leave here after the past two weeks, you will be able to engage the world when they launch accusations such as the Bible endorses slavery, all right? So here we go. Uh, Point number one, the New Testament is a drastically different culture than the Old Testament. Uh, I want to highlight some of these differences because along with them comes a drastically different system of slavery than what we saw last week. So here are some of the differences. First, time. Last week in the Old Testament, we were at 400 BC, uh, 1400 BC. Today in the New Testament, we're around 60 AD. So we have, almost have 1500 years of difference in time. The government in the Old Testament, it was a theocracy. If you remember, Israel at the time of Exodus had no king. They were a theocracy. In the New Testament, it's a Roman Empire with the Caesar. Uh, economics. In the Old Testament, it was an agrarian society. It was, uh, they were mostly a household industry. So remember, as I said last week, there aren't Microsofts down the street or Amazons down the street. Everything was run out of the home. In the New Testament, it's fairly the same, except there have been uh, new... Uh, trades such as textiles and merchants and artists and builders and farmers uh, who, all, who work for the economy. Uh, religion. In the Old Testament, they were governed by the Jewish law, what we call the Torah. All right, that's, how they, that's how they lived. In the New Testament, it's almost this Judeo-Christianity that's beginning to morph into Christianity. All right, you've got the Jewish system morphing into Christianity. Uh, culture. In the Old Testament, they were a very inward Jewish mindset. They were very inward focused, all right? In the New Testament, they're immersed in Greco-Roman culture. If you remember historically, there was this process called a Hellenization by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered the known world, and his desire was to make everything Greek. That's why the New Testament's written in Greek. All right, so that's the culture of the New Testament. Now, despite these differences, slavery, both the evil institution and the merciful uh, indentured servanthood institution that we looked at last week, both of those still exist in the New Testament. Most historians estimate that over one-fourth of the Roman Empire were slaves. So even after 1,500 years, slavery still exist. And even after 1,500 years after this, it still exists. This is still a problem. All right. Number two, the Greek word for slave and master. Look at verse 15 of Philemon, in verse 15 and 16. Paul writes to Philemon, for this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant. That word there, bondservant, uh, a lot of times it's translated as slave. It's the Greek word doulos. It occurs 126 times in the New Testament. It's translated as slave, servant, and bondservant. There's no distinction between servant, slave, and bondservant in the Greek. All right, so regardless of what translation you have in the Bible, when you see the word servant, slave, bondservant, almost always they're the same word, okay? Okay. So I want to make sure, be careful that when you read the Bible, you don't make a distinction like, well, this was a servant and this was a slave, all right? The Greek didn't make that distinction. So this morning, you're going to hear me use all three terms, slave, servant, and doulos or bondservant. I'm I'm not making that distinction when I use it, okay? 
Uh, further, uh, the word master does not occur in the book of Philemon. We don't see it in Philemon, but we do see it throughout the New Testament. Uh, the word for master is kurios, and it's used 713 times. It's all over the New Testament. It's translated as Lord, Master, Owner, Sir. 638 of the 713 times. So 90% of the time, it's translated as Lord. And 629 of the 638 times, it refers to the Lord. All right, so almost 90% of the time, when the word curios occurs in the New Testament, it's referring to God himself. All right. Again, why do I point all this out? I want to point it out because I want us to understand that the Greek ear did not hear the term slave and master the way that we do. Just as in the Hebrew they didn't. When we hear the word slave, master, we immediately probably think of a ruthless owner and a piece of property. The Greek ear did not necessarily hear it that way. Okay? Uh, so much so that even Jesus uses this language. Which brings us to point three, Jesus' usage of doulos and curios. I find it interesting that in over seven of Jesus' parables, he used the master-servant language. They were kind of common characters. You could argue they were the most common characters in his parables. But then that leaves us with the question of, did Jesus approve of slavery? Since he used this language. We've all heard the arguments before, you know, uh, well, slave owners for years used the Bible to justify slavery, you know, and, and, and that's true. That's true, but that doesn't mean that then you must dismiss the Bible. That's what they're getting at. Here's what that would be like. That would be like making an argument, well, Hitler used discipline to justify the Nazi regime. So we should just dismiss discipline. You can't make that argument. Just because slave owners use the Bible to justify slavery doesn't give us a right to then just to dismiss the Bible. Right? Everybody understand the argument there? All right. <clears throat> um, but we know historically that slave owners did use Scripture to justify their slavery. We even see this. If, uh, again, I pointed out last week the, the movie 12 Years a Slave. Uh, if you've never seen the movie, uh, one of the slave owners in the movie he actually is reading a parable from Jesus and at the end, to justify his slaves, to justify beating his slaves. At the end of it, he says, that's scripture. That's the argument he makes. Now, what's the parable that he reads? He reads Luke 12, 47 to 48. This is what the parable uh, says. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Now in the movie, he uses that parable to justify him beating his slaves. All right? But let's back up for just a minute. We've got to understand the point of a parable. What, what is the purpose of parables? Jesus used parables to illustrate one general truth without working out the nitty-gritty details of everything. Jesus sometimes would use sinful means to illustrate a righteous truth. This parable that Jesus gives is in the context of eternity. It's in the context of Jesus talking about us. We are the servants. He is the master. He, he's, he's using to say that those who don't do what their master said will be punished. But even so, let's read the context of what the, the parable is, is here. In, in Luke 12, 45, two verses beforehand, this is the, the character of the servant. It says, but if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female slaves and to eat and drink and get drunk. So this is a servant who is beating his fellow servants, stealing his master's booze, getting drunk, stealing his food. So this is hardly some uh, a slave owner who's just beating a slave because he just feels like it. But I want us to, I want us to consider a more glorious truth that Jesus uses with master-servant language. 
There's one such parable where Jesus uses master-servant language to illustrate a glorious truth. And it's in Matthew 18. It'll be on the screen for you. Jesus says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. His doulos. Same word. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now again, you've heard me preach on this before, but 10, 000, one talent is what a Jewish worker could earn in 20 years. So 10,000 talents was equal to 200,000 years of wages. Something you could never pay back. You'd have to live 200,000 years to pay this back for an average worker. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold. He's a servant. I can sell him off to recoup some of my debt. He orders him to be sold, his wife, his children, all that he had, and his payment to be made. So his servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Now that's kind of funny, because he can never pay this back. Ever. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him all the debt. Now Jesus is giving that as an illustration to say, this is us and God. That we are the doulos. He is the master. And we owe him an unpayable debt. And out of just pure compassion, he forgives it all. Jesus is using this to illustrate the heart that every master should have in regards to his servants. This is the heart that a master should have. Number four, the New Testament forbids slavery that was built off of kidnapping and or race. As we looked at last week, we know historically that modern slavery was frequently built off of kidnapping and or race. But the Bible expressly forbid this. We saw this last week in the Old Testament. In Exodus 21, 16, whoever steals a man and sells him and is found in possession of him shall be put to death. If you kidnapped someone and sold them into slavery, it was the death penalty. But this is still forbidden in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 1.10, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. That word there, enslaver, is the Greek word andropodistis. It only occurs one time in the New Testament. It's translated as enslaver, kidnapper, or slave trader. Most scholars believe that this refers to somebody who acquires slaves by kidnapping them. All right? <clears throat> and the category that Paul puts those people in, in verse 9, is the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, the sinners, the unholy, and the profane. So, when somebody says that the Bible does not forbid slavery, I think that we should ask them, whoa, 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 hold up. What do you mean by that? What do you mean when you say the Bible does not forbid slavery? Because we have to ask, what is Paul forbidding right here in 1 Timothy? What is he forbidding there? Now, just as a side note, this is just extra, okay, as a side note. It's interesting that those who would use the so-called endorsement of slavery argument to justify homosexuality, I mean, here's how the argument goes. Um, you Christians say that homosexuality is wrong. Well, the Bible uh, condones slavery. The Bible is okay with slavery, so how we can't trust the Bible. Just as an interesting, right here we see side by side men who practice homosexuality and enslavers. Both of them are put side by side, and both of them are condemned together. All right. Further, we know that modern slavery was frequently built off of race. And Paul has no tolerance for discrimination of race. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.11, here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Meaning that the barriers that often and still do divide us to this day, the gospel demolishes 
all of those barriers. There is no room for racism or racial discrimination in the gospel. Zero. However, even apart from kidnapping, even apart from racial discrimination, this system still exists. There are still people who live in poverty and are forced to sell themselves into slavery. There are still people who are kidnapped and sold into slavery <coughs> and they become, they become Christians while they are slaves. And Paul has to address these situations. Paul has to give commands of how to live. And this leads us to point number five. Paul's household codes were guidelines for living in the system, not necessarily condoners of the system. Uh, you'll hear me use this phrase, household codes. You, if, you, if you hear that phrase, what do I mean by that? The household codes are what we find like in Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, 1 Timothy 2, Titus 2, 1 Peter 2. It, you know, all those passages that talk about how wives and husbands should relate to one another and how masters and servants should relate to one another and how parents and children should relate to one another. Those are called the household codes. That's the, there's, a, there's a German term that's the more official term, but we'll, we'll say household codes, okay? Uh, and commentator F.F. F. Bruce writes this, the household codes did not set out to abolish or reshape existing social structures, but to Christianize them. As far as slavery was concerned, it took a long time for the essential incompatibility of the institution with the ethic of the gospel, or indeed with the biblical doctrine of creation, to be properly assimilated by the general Christian consciousness. Now what Bruce is saying there is that meaning that, listen, the Christian ethic uh, of ending slavery, it wasn't going to uproot the entire Roman Empire system of slavery. Paul wasn't going to write the letter of Colossians and the entire Roman Empire overnight dismantled their slavery. That was never going to happen. So Paul has to give instructions for Christians to live in this system. This is why he gives instructions like Titus 2.9. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of our God, our Savior. Now when we read that, we might think, how can Paul tell servants to be submissive to their masters? How can he say that? Is Paul condoning slavery? No, he's not. He's giving guidelines for how to live in the system. All right, <clears throat> just as a side note, uh, lest we think Paul telling servants to be submissive to their masters is unreasonable, this is not the only context that Paul and the New Testament as a whole give instructions to be submissive. The New Testament gives multiple categories of submission. The New Testament says every Christian is to be submissive to governing authorities, that wives are to be submissive to husbands, that every Christian is to be submissive to God, that the younger are to be submissive to elders. And then kind of as a catch-all, Paul says in two places, every Christian, be submissive to every Christian. So just be submissive to everybody, right? That's kind of the, what Paul says. So lest we think that like, wow, this is really like, you know, wrong that Paul encourages people to be submissive. He encourages everybody to be submissive. All right. Number six, the New Testament counterculturally gives commands for masters to treat their servants with love, dignity, and respect. Now, these household codes that Paul gave were completely countercultural to ancient literature. All right. We have to be careful that we don't just read the Bible and then compare it to modern literature. We can't do that, right? We have to read the Bible and compare it to other ancient literature and see how does this differ or disagree or agree with other ancient literature. Traditional Greco-Roman household rules talked about masters ruling their slaves. Brutal treatment of slaves was the norm in the Roman Empire. It was common for masters to threaten their slaves with beatings. It was common to threaten them to sell them away, thus ripping them apart from their family. And we want to say, is this the kind of instructions that Paul gives? No, 
Consider the commands that Paul gives to his masters, to, to the masters. Ephesians 6, 9, masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening. He says, do the same to them. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But he says, stop your threatening. Paul counterculturally gives a command to masters to stop threatening their servants. In Colossians 4.1, he says, Masters, treat your servants justly and fairly. This is hardly the picture that we see of secular slavery, where there were beatings and threatenings. Commentator Karen Job said, while some modern interpreters consider the New Testament household codes to be hopelessly chauvinistic, they fail to read the codes against their contemporary literature, which shows that the New Testament writers actually subverted cultural expectations by elevating the slave and the wife with unparalleled dignity. No ancient document that we have comes anywhere close to treating doulos or even women for that matter, with the love, dignity, and respect that the Bible does. Nowhere in any secular literature was what Paul was commanding for women and for husbands and for masters and for servants was unbelievably countercultural in those days. Number seven, many masters were loving masters. Look at Philemon 4 through 7. Paul writes to Philemon, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and your faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Now consider this for just a minute. Here is Philemon, a doulos owner, a master, and Paul does not condemn him. Paul actually praises Philemon's love and faith toward the saints. So I think Paul is affirming that, yes, he's still an owner, but he is a loving owner. Okay? Even in the gospel, remember the, uh, the centurion who had a deathly ill servant, and he sends people to Jesus to go heal his servant? Luke 7, now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him to the elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. Now we might be inclined to, to read that as, well, he was highly valued. Of course he was. He's a financial asset. We might think that's what is meant there, but that's not, I don't think so. Why? Because that word's only used one other time in the New Testament. You know where it's used? It's used in 1 Peter 2, 4 where it's translated as precious, referring to Jesus. You could equally translate this as he had a servant who was precious to him. So we have two examples in Scripture of Philemon and the centurion who were loving curios. All right? Number eight. Now some might say, well, that, that's not everybody, Right? I mean, that's probably the exception. Yes, that's not everybody. But even when the system uh, was abused, when there was abuse of the system, God is a perfect judge. Not every master was a ruthless owner, and not every master was a loving master. And Paul knows this. How does he know this? Because we're human. We're sinful. He knows we're going to be sinful. And so notice the impetus that Paul gives in the household codes. In Ephesians 6, 9, he says, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening. Now, why? Why should I stop my threatening? Why should I treat them the same? Knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Paul's basically saying, you and your doulos have the same master. Colossians 3. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly. Why? What's the impetus for me to treat my servant justly and fairly? He's a servant. He can't he can do with him what I want. 
He, he's got no, 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 no leg to stand upon. Why should I do that? What's the impetus, Paul? And here's what Paul says. Knowing that you also have a master in heaven. My paraphrase of that, nobody gets away scot-free. Paul is basically arguing to masters, don't treat your servants any differently than how you would want your master to treat you. Because everybody will stand before this master one day. And this master shows no partiality. He doesn't care if you are emperor or pauper. It doesn't make any difference to him. He shows no partiality. He is a perfect judge and he will render to each perfectly. So when he says do the same to them, what is he saying? He is saying serve your servants with fear and trembling. That just raised the bar big time, meaning that if you are a boss and you have employees, or if you are a pastor and you have congregants, or if you are an owner and you have servants, serve them with fear and trembling, knowing you will stand before the master one day and give an account. So even when people abuse this system, nobody got away scot-free. Nine. The New Testament counterculturally recognizes servants as the body of Christ. In Greco Roman writings, slaves were not addressed ever. But Paul addresses the servants directly in his letters. Remember, these letters, Colossians and Ephesians and, and, and uh, 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 Philemon, these were letters written to churches that were read aloud to the church. So by addressing them in his letter, he affirms that they are a part of the body of Christ no more or no less than their masters. 1 Corinthians 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized in one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. All were made to drink of one spirit. This is certainly countercultural to Greco-Roman society, where if you were a servant in that society, you knew your place. And Paul says, in the body of Christ, that's not the case. You are all one in Christ. So, Paul could affirm that in the body of Christ, whether you're male or female, free or slave, uh, rich or poor, it doesn't matter, we're all the same, but socially, politically, economically, that's not going to be realized overnight. The Roman Empire is not going to understand that overnight. And so, th- remember, in the New Testament, this is a seam in history. This is a time when the early church is having massive paradigm shifts, and they've got to figure out, how does our culture, how does our Jewish culture fit into Christianity? How does our Gentile culture fit into Christianity? How do we fit culture into Christianity? And they're trying to figure that out. Number 10, but Paul's desire is that slavery among Christians not exist. Paul's desire is that the entire system of slavery among Christians not exist, period. How do we know this? Look at verse 15 and 16 of Philemon. He writes to Philemon, for this is perhaps why he was parted from you from a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. I think it is very clear that Paul is asking Philemon to redefine his relationship with Onesimus. He's asking Philemon to treat Onesimus as a brother in Christ. Now we might ask, well, why doesn't Paul uh, just command Philemon to release Onesimus? Why doesn't he just, you know, probably the biggest question is, if the New Testament or the Bible forbids slavery, why does nowhere Paul just say, stop slavery? Why does Paul never just come right out and command the church, no more slaves, release them all? Why does he not do that? That's the question. And to that answer, we turn to 11, 12, and 13. Number 11, 
because Christians must still live like Christians even if they find themselves in contra-gospel conditions. Paul could desire Philemon to release Onesimus, but even if he doesn't, Onesimus still has to live like a Christian. Paul can desire that slave owners release their slaves, but even if they don't, Christians must still learn to live in contra-gospel conditions. For example, let's say that the United States government, if you're a citizen, brought the draft back and decided to send us off to fight a war. And let's say we concluded that it was an unjust war. It wasn't right. That doesn't give us a right on the battlefield to just, dis, to just do what we want. And to just, you know, a general gives us an order and say, I'm not listening to that. This is an unjust war. We would still have to live as a Christian, even though we find ourselves in a contra gospel condition. I'll give you one other example. Let's say we argue that capitalism breeds greed. You could argue that. We still have to live as Christians. I hardly think that any of us are protesting Amazon or Microsoft because the top executives make $30 million a year and are living greedy lives. I, 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 was, I was reading the news uh, uh, today and I saw uh, back in July that Jeff Bezos in, in July in one hour made $7 billion dollars to become the fifth richest person in the world. Seven billion dollars in one hour. Now, should I protest Chris for working for Amazon because he's, he's part of a system that's breeding Jeff Bezos' greed? You're contributing to the greed. No, because Chris must still learn to live as a Christian in that system. This is why Paul can give instructions such as bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. This is why Paul can say to First Timothy, uh, to Timothy, uh, let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. And probably the most difficult one is from Peter. You know Peter's going to take it up a notch. Peter kind of pulls a what would Jesus do argument. You know, I, I, I've read this passage before, and at the end of it, when I finish reading, I'm like, really, Peter? Like, really? Did you just make that argument? Peter says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin, you are beaten it? For it and you endure. But if you do good and suffer for it and you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now, did you catch that? You have been called to suffer. That's his encouragement to a servant who is suffering. That it is a gracious thing in the sight of God. You know, in a world where we live to protect ourselves, don't, don't, we, don't, we, don't we go out of our way to try to protect ourselves from, from suffering at all costs? Peter says, endure it, because it's gracious in the sight of God when you do. And if you notice in all three of the passages, the argument is that it's more important to honor God and glorify God and hold His name up high to a lost world than to achieve earthly freedom. It is more important to honor God than to gain earthly freedom. That's the argument. This is why Jesus could say things like, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Yes, it's wrong for a Roman soldier to force it. In those days, a Roman soldier could walk up to any Jew and say, hey, carry my gear for one mile. 
and they had to do it. And that's wrong. And Jesus says, just dismantle them all together. At the end of the mile one, say, hey man, can I carry it another? Number 12. Paul affirms Christian freedom is greater than earthly freedom without denigrating earthly freedom. Look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when is called is a bondservant of Christ. Now, did you catch that? Paul said, if you are a doulos, when you become a Christian, don't be concerned with gaining your freedom. You're like, what? Now, why? Why would Paul say, don't be concerned with your earthly freedom? You, know, you might say, that's easy for you to say, Paul. Just as a side note, it wasn't easy for Paul to say. Paul spent most of his time writing these letters in a prison cell. At times, voluntarily sitting in a prison cell. There were times he could have been released, and he chose not to for gospel reasons. So it wasn't easy for Paul to say that. Nonetheless, why would Paul tell a servant who finds themselves in an institution of slavery to not be concerned about gaining their freedom? Why would he do that? I think Paul would answer, because you're already free. You're already free. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Paul's argument is that, look, if you're a Christian, don't be concerned with gaining freedom because you're already free. However, Paul's not denigrating earthly freedom. I think that's why he includes the parenthetical. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself the opportunity. Basically saying, look, if you can go free, go for it. Don't, don't just stay a doulos because you're lazy. If you can get free, then go free. But don't be concerned about it. And the third reason that Paul doesn't demand the release of slaves is that love cannot be forced. And we read the book of Philemon, we, we, we want to ask, like, why does Paul simply not command Philemon to release Onesimus? Why doesn't he just order? He's got apostolic authority. And look at verse 8 and 9. Paul gives us the reason. He says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. In verse 13 and 14, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. Paul realizes that you cannot force people to love. You might can force them to obey, but you can't force them to obey for the right reasons. Onesimus owes some debt to Philemon. And it's not technically wrong for Philemon to cash in on this debt. It's not wrong for him to cash in on that debt. He owes a debt. But Paul was appealing to a higher standard, love. You see, for love to be love, it must be without compulsion and freely. I recently read a response from John Piper on how Christians should think about socialism. And he, and he basically sums it up, which I thought was a very helpful summary. Socialism borrows the compassionate aims of Christianity in meeting people's needs while rejecting the Christian expectation that this compassion not be coerced or forced. Basically, Paul could command Philemon to do what is required. He says in verse 8, I could command you, Philemon. I could tell you what to do, but I'm not going to. Why? Because it glorifies God more if Philemon sets him free, freely and out of love. So if we're basically at the 
If Paul's not going to command this, how does the institution of slavery come to an end in the church? And it comes to an end on number 14. The New Testament calls us to love our neighbor as ourself, which dismantles slavery at its very fabric. Jesus told us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. As Thompson puts it, who's a commentator, he says, if a Christian owned a slave, the highest duty to which the master could be called was not to set that slave free, but to love the slave with the self-giving love of Christ. In some cases, setting the servant free was to love them. And in other cases, as it was in Philemon's case, it would be to receive them back, but as a brother, to provide for them or to give them a job or to help them out or to serve in ministry with them. You see, this is a higher ethic than just ending an institution. It does no good if we just end slavery well, so what? This is a higher ethic. Don't just end slavery. Let's go one step more and love our neighbor as ourself. No, the Bible does not endorse slavery. The Bible endorses loving our neighbor as ourself. This is a much higher ethic. And then verse, uh, point 15, last point. As we conclude our study on slavery, um, I want to conclude with a paradox. As Christians, our identity as freedmen enables us to find our identity as slaves. The New Testament doesn't so much abolish slavery as it does completely transform it. Now, rather than seeing myself as a master, our identity is found in being a slave of Christ. You see, the paradox of Christianity is that Jesus sets us free to enslave us to himself. Paul repeatedly refers to himself as a slave of Christ. It's his common introduction, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Galatians 1.10, Philippians, Titus. It, it's how he introduces himself when he writes these letters. It's like, you know, when I introduce myself, I say, Hi, I'm Matt, pastor of CSBC. Paul says, Hi, I'm Paul, a slave of Christ. Paul encourages earthly servants to see themselves as slaves of Christ. Paul calls Epaphras a slave of Christ. Peter calls himself a slave of Christ. Jude calls himself a slave of Christ. This is the pattern that we see in the New Testament as to how we find our identity. You know, in a world where everybody is achieving or, or striving for greatness, to get ahead, to climb the socioeconomic ladder, we're all trying to get to a certain status or level or education or money or bigger home or whatever. In a world that, that exists, Jesus gives us radical instructions and he says, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Be a doulos of everybody. Now just think about that for a moment. Jesus says, don't just release your doulos. Become a doulos. Jesus didn't just abolish slavery. He radically transformed it. I pray that we will find our identity not in freedom as we typically mean freedom. We would find our identity in being slaves of Christ. We'd find joy in being his slave. Just a few moments, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And uh, if you're uh, a Christian and have been baptized before, we invite you to join with us in partaking of it. Uh, if you're not a Christian or if you haven't been baptized, we ask that you do refrain from it. But we do invite you to join us in prayer and in meditation. Um, what we're about to do is, is basically proclaim the, the, the death of Jesus Christ, the, his body and his blood that, he, that was broken and spilled out for us. And we take this bread and this cup
as a reminder, as a proclamation, that we are trusting in Him and His atoning work on the cross to save us. And so I, I hope that you will use this time to draw near to our Master. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you um, that you could be a ruthless master. You could be a king who just dominates us and dictates to us, Lord, but you are a king who came and served beside us, who came and washed feet and touched the lepers and um, fed the hungry and touched the dead and, and, um, and loved with the love that we are so challenged by. Lord, you are a master who exceeds all um, understanding that we have of compassion and kindness and mercy. Lord, that you are near to the brokenhearted. And um, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be as such, that we would be motivated by your love and that we would learn to serve one another, that we would learn to be slaves of one another, Lord, serving each other out of our love for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.